Um, hello, hello to everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Peter, Curtis, and Wendy for inviting me to be the discussion for this wonderful colloquium. Um, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to offer some general comments as well as to raise some points for further discussion. Yes. To start with, you know, uh, for me, this colloquium as a whole is a powerful reminder and powerful confirmation of the many problems associated with, you know, with English, with language policy, with EMI, uh, and the internationalization of higher education, particularly in transnational context across different Asian and uh, Asian countries and the Gulf region. Particularly in this colloquium, you know, many of you, you have uh, showcased um, examples from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, China, and Turkey. Uh, and it is also evident in all your presentation that the guidelines for teaching, learning, and language use in EMI policies across national and institutional contexts are rather ad hoc, um, vague, and disconnected. Teachers and students in most uh, of these um, contexts are often left alone uh, with their own ideologies, assumptions, and expectations about language and EMI. And it's also evident that the dominance of English continues regardless of how multilingual all the transnational higher education contexts are. Yep. And, uh, from all your papers, uh, it's also uh, clear that um, it is very important and timely to do more research on this topic. And it is also very um, important to approach the topic from a diverse range of methodologies and conceptual frameworks, including those outside uh, linguistic, uh, applied linguistics and critical applied linguistics. And it is also very important to uh, develop more in-depth and rigorous ethnographical studies on EMI, as you know, your work has um, argued for. And also the data reported in all your presentation is not only um, rich, diverse, but also points to many nuances underlying the dominance of English and EMI. Actually, you know, the international and transnational aspects of higher education rely on the intensity of English and EMI, while multilingual or multilinguality seems to only play a marginal role and is often referred to as a kind of cosmetic, which is a shame, right? And this very issue needs to be engaged with at all levels. And I'd like to remind everyone that we are all complicit in this very problem as well. And in your uh, colloquium, uh, we can, yeah, I can see that the cultural politics of language policy regarding EMI you know, ought to be discussed from within all these transnational uh, higher education contexts and by as many participants as possible. And at the same time, you know, um, language policy or EMI don't take, take place um, free from the commodification of EMI, of English language teaching, the emphasis on the market economy, and global rankings, you know, adhered to by many universities, as well as the increasing influence of neoliberalism on education globally, right? All these factors have joined hands to project EMI as a desirable construct, socially, culturally, interculturally, ideologically, pragmatically, and effectively. Yep. Um, right, so up to now, you know, I can once again, um, um, you know, uh, make a point that English and EMI are on the rise globally, and there's so much literature supporting this. Um, but I'd like to, uh, take a step further by asking these questions. So why EMI, how, for whom, by whom, and so, um, right? So uh, in addition to what you all have presented, I'd like to re-emphasize a couple of uh, points as to why EMI is so desirable. 
or at least projected as a, de uh, as a desirable object. So global and international role of English, yes, the nation building, modernization, globalization processes, internationalization of education and recruitment of students and also the domestic and international competitive needs, global rankings, they are all putting a lot of pressure on universities. And also universities are concerned with their status and recognition and at the same time, the commercialization and commodification of English and EMI um, are on the rise in response to reduce funding for education from many parts of the world. And we also see a growing middle class and their desire for better education, better English and EMI, and also the opportunities for overseas studies. And of course, increasing mobilities of people and ideas across the world, all these uh, all join hands to uh, contribute to the increasing um, dominance of EMI. Uh, yeah, but at the same time, all these factors have enabled and forced EMI to be implemented and promoted. And in these processes, we've seen active, proactive, and passive approaches to EMI. And I can refer to so many adjectives to describe you know, EMI and such a processes. Systematic, random, ad hoc, strategic, and yeah, selective, integral, blended, continuous, limited, bottom up, top down, self generated, needs driven, policy aided, high end, low end, elite, advanced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, but for whom and by whom, right? And of course, there are so many issues and problems uh, reported in the existing literature, including my own work. Yeah, so I can highlight some of them. Up to now, there is a little evidence to show that EMI actually enhances language learning and content knowledge. And at the same time, you know, the dominance of English and EMI have also caused identity crisis at all levels and involve all stakeholders. And native speakerism is increasingly dominant, I mean, evident. And, and also how much you know, students pay has a lot to do with uh, the association of EMI to native speaker um, Englishes and West, so-called Western quality, um, right? And there are so many stereotypes being made about imagined and fixed clear-cut culture differences and East-West binaries regarding educational values, teaching and learning style in transnational context. And when it comes to intercultural competence, it's always about an imagined West and the idea of the West. Now I'd like to share some of my own uh, points, some further points. Yes, English dominance continues, but mostly by desire, will and agency in many parts of the world. EMI promotes and consolidates the view that the West is better. And the desire for English, EMI, and the idea of the West is increasing when some parts of the world are also rising with wealth and opportunities. And, and we also see the commercialization of coloniality in many EMI contexts and settings. And yes, very importantly, EMI and language policy, though problematic as we've seen, have also resulted in many success stories. Therefore, I would like to argue that as well as identifying and discussing problems. Uh, more research on transformation and success stories is needed, as my earlier work shows, even in seemingly most problematic transnational context, transformation does take place. Um, and it is very important to move towards engaging with EMI teachers and students as resources and active agents of change. And that is why it is important to make full use of everyone's cultural, educational, intellectual, and linguistic knowledge and capabilities. And all these include incorporating the literature on chance languaging, critical intercultural communication, and EMI in relation to English uh, as lingua franca, on English as an international language, and the internationalization of higher education for all, as this colloquium has collectively demonstrated. And therefore, it's very important to 
uh, you know, to be more forceful about um, re multilingualism as pedagogy, policy, practice, and identity making. And for all these to be possible, I'd like to see progressive EMI teacher training programs and professional development to be in place. And, and I would also like to encourage more collaboration from all of us, not just in terms of research, but in terms of pedagogies and classroom instruction. Thank you for your attention, yes.